So in this episode, we're going to continue along with this idea that there were very specific ancient prophecies that foretold of a Messiah that was going to come to rescue Israel from her enemies and also to save the world. We've looked at one prophecy. We're going to look at a second prophecy now. Yeah, so today we're going to look at Numbers 24, 15 to 19. Again, this is a very famous prophecy and it comes from the Torah, the five books of Moses, specifically the book of Numbers. And here we have an actual true prophecy from a false prophet. His name was Balaam. And Balaam was very well known in the ancient world as a prophet and, or as a seer. And he was hired by Balak to actually curse Israel. But every time he tried to curse Israel, God would speak through him in blessing. And on this one occasion, uh, Balaam sorry, is... sorry, sounds like a Jim Carrey movie to me. You know where he puts his mouth. <laughs> oh, like, right. just... Bruce Almighty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just so basically, thing. it is that. Yeah, and um, he tries to curse, but he just keeps speaking blessing. On this one occasion, he looks into the distant future and sees this this figure, this character, um, and gives some specific detail about um, this person. So let's have a look then at Numbers twenty four verses fifteen to nineteen, and uh, we'll read. Then he spoke his message, the prophecy of Balaam, son of Beor, the prophecy of one whose eyes see clearly, the prophecy of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who falls prostrate and whose eyes are opened. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of the people of Seth. Edom shall be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. So here we have a prophecy from Balaam. He's looking into the distant future and he sees that a ruler will come. Now the sign or the symbol of this ruler is a star. That's very, very important because Balaam was from the region of where the wise men came from as well. I was just referring to the star over Bethlehem. Yes. And in the ancient world, a star was often a symbol of a people's God. So he's not just saying, I'm seeing a future ruler coming. He's saying there is this God who's coming as a future ruler of the people of Israel. So he's saying something more than just a literal star but a star is his sign a star is his symbol but is it, so is it a double meaning that there'll be a star that will show the arrival of this person or was he actually referring to it more as like it's a god because it's a star or is it both well yeah both i think because in the ancient world a star symbolized your god and we know that the wise men who came from the same region they they were looking for a specific sign in the heavens mm. and they also had the prophet daniel as the head of the Magi in Babylon, um, who had taught the Magi the probably the 70 week prophecy that we'll look at a future episode, the timing of the Messiah. So they knew the timing of the Messiah. And when they saw this star arise coming out of Jacob, they obviously recognized that sign that, hey, the Messiah has been born, this future ruler has been born. And this is why the Magi come and they present gifts and they worship the baby because they recognize this isn't just a human leader, a human Messiah. Because he is the star. But how did they recognize the star had come? Was it because of the star in the sky? Or... Yes. Right. Okay. So they do work in together. So, yeah. You've, so you've got this kind of, yeah, you've, mm-hmm. you've got this meaning of this brilliance in the sky mm-hmm. at the time when the Messiah is to be born. They recognize there's this brilliance. They recognize the time has been fulfilled for him to be born. And they also know that the, the symbol of a star is, is um, a symbol for the people's God. Mm. And so they put two and two together and realize their God has been born into a human body and they come there with gifts to worship him. Because, you know, we think the Babylonians were the enemies of Israel. Why on earth would they come to worship a Jewish baby? Was that Daniel's influence? Like, Yeah, so Balaam's and Daniel's influence together. Mm -hmm. And that's why they responded in the way that they did. Okay, what else can we extract from that prophecy? Sure, so um, we're told that He's not present at that time. So this cannot be referring to Moses or any other kind of great prophet of that era. 
but he's looking into the distant future and he sees this one coming. Mm -hmm. He sees that the sign of this person is a star, which once again is a symbol of the people's God. Uh, we're also told that um, he's going to come out of Israel. He's going to come out of Jacob. And so he's going to be Jewish born. And finally, he will conquer the enemies of Israel. So we're told here that um, he will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of uh, Sheth. Uh, Edom will be conquered. Syria's enemy will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. So this is a reference now to the second coming of Jesus. I was just going to say, because Jesus was a very humble king, and this is what frustrated the Jews at the time. It's like, why isn't he becoming like, you know, a war hero and, and physically taking Israel back or, you know, defending against its enemies? This was the future yes, for so Israel. But absolutely. we haven't even fully arrived at right now. This is like even the future beyond today, right? Yes, it is second coming. And this is why the Jewish rabbis became so confused yeah. with these prophecies, because God often put first and second coming prophecies together as one prophecy. And so you'll see the two roles of the Messiah, first of all, coming to die for the sins of the nation, uh, humble, riding on donkey. a donkey, and at the second coming, coming to conquer on a white horse, mm -hmm. a white steed. Uh, to overthrow the Gentile nations. And so you've got these two comings often put together in a single prophecy, and this happens quite a lot throughout the Old Testament prophets. And here we're told at the second coming, Jesus will not come in peace. He will come with a sword to bring um, the Gentile kingdoms and empires to an end to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, what's the Jewish interpretation of that prophecy? Okay, so if we look at the Mishnah Torah, Kings and Wars 11, verse 1, it says, The Messiah uh, was David who saved Israel from her adversaries. The final Messiah will be from his sons and will deliver Israel from the hands of the descendants of Esau. There it says, I shall see him, but not now. This refers to David. I behold him, and not soon. This is the King Messiah. A star from Jacob shall step forth. This is David and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. This is the King Messiah. So they split these verses into two messiahs. You've got David is the first messiah, and the Messiah Messiah is the second messiah at the end of days. And they're going to do two different roles. And you'll often see throughout uh, rabbinic Judaism, they had this concept of two messiahs, a messiah who would come and die for the sins of the people, and the messiah who would rule and reign and conquer, because they couldn't quite tie together how he can both come on a donkey and on the clouds of heaven to conquer, so on and so forth. So they had this two messiah concept. But the mistake they were making is that there's not two messiahs, there's one messiah who comes twice. So, but it's interesting too that they ascribe one, one of their interpretations is it's David. Yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, how would we refute that? Uh, simply because when you put the prophecies together, only Jesus of Nazareth fulfills them. I think on an individual basis, you might strain or struggle to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other rabbinic interpretations of this verse too, which we can have a look at now, if you like. Yeah. Um, so the Hachaim on uh, Numbers 24 says, Moreover, when uh, Balaam describes the Messiah as a star emerging from Jacob, he refers to the Messiah, who is a descendant of David, whereas he speaks of the Messiah in terms of his being a scepter rising out of Israel. This is a reference to the Messiah from the tribe of Ephraim. So this, again, very clearly, um, another rabbi now is speaking about this coming Messiah. He does not refer it to David. He doesn't say this is David. He says this is the Messiah. And so you see that rabbis have disagreements with other rabbis and they debate this. Yeah, mm. there's an old saying, you've got two rabbis, you've got four opinions. Right, right. Because they've <laughs> got different opinions on different scriptures. But what they're all saying is this scripture has something to do with the coming of the Messiah. Now, who they interpret that Messiah to be, whether it's David or Hezekiah or some other prophet, um, they'll have different interpretations as to who this Messiah could potentially be, but it is the Messiah. Could I ask, um, I don't know if you can answer this, but in general, in uh, Jewish belief in the present day, what what's the general understanding? So they still hold to this idea of two Messiahs, but they just um, haven't caught up with the fact that it's 
two different times of arrival, two comings. Um, I mean, we know that unless a Jew becomes a Christian in terms of believing Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled and was the Messiah, then they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. So that would be his first arrival for them. But in terms of just general how they hold to these texts now, is their belief that there is still two messiahs? Would that be their general interpretation? No. And once again, there's not a general view nowadays because right. Judaism is so different today than it was in the first century. There's right. a variety of beliefs. So some Jewish people will say that there is a messiah, the messiah is coming. There are other people who believe the messiah is in the world right now. Other people believe that the Messiah isn't necessarily a person, but an age. And other people will completely deny a Messiah. Other Jewish people will say the Messiah can potentially be a Gentile ruler. Who will bring Sorry, peace are they Israel. reading not only the prophecies, but their own texts, their own rabbinic there, there's texts? There's <laughs> been 2,000 years of thought and discussion that, you know, it's called the Talmud. Um, the Gemara that kind of like discusses uh, the oral law and what the Torah actually says. And there's all these thoughts and ideas within Judaism today. So to pinpoint, to sort of pin a Jewish person down and say, you believe this specific thing about God and about the Messiah, it's not really like that anymore. When I have discussions with rabbis and I have discussions with Jewish people, you will find there is a uh, kind of plethora of beliefs and ideas mm. and understandings. And so it's very difficult today to pin anyone down on what they actually believe. Right, the Messiah. So what could be helpful then in these episodes is that we just stay focused on what the, the ancient forefathers believed about the prophecies because a lot of these texts were written AD? Yeah, so obviously you've got the, the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament. Yeah. That was written down um, 1,400 years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, oh, that's so interesting. So they've looked at the ancient prophecies, then they've interpreted them, and they are very specifically talking about a Messiah and confirming what these prophecies said. But then when Jesus arrives, he's not recognized. Absolutely. Yeah. Because what did Jesus do when he arrived? Well, well not, he... not what they thought. He... No, did, he well, did, did he praise them up for being such great leaders? Right. No, he kind of rebuked them and, and he cursed Israel and he brought judgment down upon it. And. You know, if you're in leadership and you're very proud and uh, as Jesus called them, kind of like whitewashed tombs and foxes and things like this and, and snakes and brood of vipers. And, you know, this would have deeply, deeply offended the religious leadership, the Sanhedrin in the first century. So, of course, they roared against him being the Messiah. I'm just wondering why he didn't try and make it a little clearer that... Yeah, guys, you're kind of on the right track. There is sort of these two messiahs, but it's not two separate messiahs. It's two times in history where I'm going to come to you. Did he try to make that clear? Just I think yeah. so. Okay. I think he was very clear at his first coming that he's um, not come to kind of overthrow the world, but he's come to save the world. And I think he made it abundantly clear. There'd be another coming. When he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Mm. I mean, we're going to look at the Zechariah prophecy at a later date, but he made it abundantly clear who he was. Did And he did explicitly say there'll be another coming, like I will be returning, right? Well, he said, you know, I go to prepare a place for you and then, so obviously, and I'm going to come back and get you. 100%. And if you look at the, pro the, the sorry, the parables of Jesus, a lot of the parables are about um, the fact that he's going away for a time. And some of the parables talk about a long time. So he's come, he's going away for a long time, and then he will return. And when he returns, then he will bring judgment. So at his first coming, it was salvation. At his second coming, it will be judgment. Okay. Are there any more um, interpretations you'd like to look at in this episode? Um, let's have a look at the Ramban, who was a very, very important uh, rabbi. And he writes, There shall step forth a star out of Jacob, because the Messiah will gather together the dispersed of Israel from all the corners of the earth. Balaam compares him metaphorically to a star that passes through the firmament from the ends of heaven, just as it is said about the Messiah. And behold, there came with the clouds of heaven, one like unto a son of man. Hold the thought. They're talking about one coming on the clouds of heaven. Right. That's pretty specific. Very specific. Mm. And this is why they got confused. Will he come on the back of a donkey, according to Zechariah, or will he come on the clouds of heaven, according to Daniel? Which is it? 
And so they came up with all kinds of interpretations. Um, if Israel are worthy, he will come on the clouds of heaven. If Israel are unworthy, he will come on the back of a donkey. And so rabbis had all of these interpretations. They were very, very confused about Jesus. I'm or about, just, sorry, about the Messiah. I mean, it, it, if they were to just accept as maybe a theory, to test the theory of there's two comings, and then just put that into all the prophets, put that understanding into all the prophecies and all the other texts that were written, and suddenly it locks into place. Like, And it would be a pretty sound theory. I'm just wondering why they wouldn't even experiment with that. Just going, let's just say this is true and let's just see how all our, our scriptures hold up. I wonder why they wouldn't do that. Because within rabbinic writings, literally, if you follow Jesus, a curse is placed upon you. But that wasn't given to them in the Torah. That was them coming up with it. Yes, but rabbinic um, interpretation of the Torah is now placed almost on the same level as the Torah itself. So if you disagree with your rabbi, you cause the, the Shekinah, I the presence of God. I don't mean to be disrespectful, God, but I'm sorry. It's like the to Torah, they, they acknowledge as um, these are the words of God, the Torah, but now we're going to place man's interpretation and ideas on the same level as the Torah, that just even as an, a non-Jewish person, that just doesn't make sense to me. Why these are uh, human ideas and interpretations. <laughs> it's like it's like a second generation of a sure. of a text. But it doesn't make sense to us. But in their culture, you see, with the destruction of the temple in seventy A.D. by the Romans, um, Pharisaism and Sadduceeism came to an end. The Sanhedrin came to an end, and so rabbinic Judaism was formed. A brand new kind of version of, of, of Judaism was formed. The Jewish people were scattered. They had to look to someone for direction. And so they began to look to their rabbis and the rabbis then began to formulate ideas and theology and understanding of the Jewish texts. And so it became tradition that the rabbis were being inspired by God to say these things and to write these things down at a later date, of course. It became tradition doesn't mean that Yeah, that's it's true. a little bit like the, the Pope's Right. The word is of equal authority almost to the Bible or to God's word because God is speaking through the Pope. It's a bit like that with the rabbis. In terms of people's understanding, not that that's the reality. It's not the reality, yeah. but they believe that to be the reality. Right. So if a rabbi then turned around and said, kind of, may the bones of Jesus be ground to powder and anyone who follows him, may they be accursed of Israel. Um, that carried significant weight within the Jewish community, so much so that today the name of Jesus is kind of odious to them. Um, I or, mean, if we were to try to find defence for them, it's their passion and fervour to serve God and not ever be put into exile again. So I understand because they, they, they can't see that Jesus fulfilled these 300 bits of evidence hmm. of the waiting Messiah that they were waiting for. So I can, I can, you can kind of defend it in the sense that because they don't see him as the Messiah, they're kind of saying, well, you'll be cursed if you believe him. So I can get where they're coming from, but it's... It's like 300 bits of evidence. I still can't get past that. That's a lot of evidence. <laughs> it's a lot of evidence. And if you are going to lead somebody to Jesus or Yeshua today, um, it really is what you're talking about. It's taking them back to the Torah, getting them to read the plain text, and then asking them, you know, what do you think this means? And often they won't want to interpret it for themselves. They'll say, I have to see what my rabbi says. Right. But if you can just get them to think for themselves... You know, who does this look like to you? Who does this point to? Who came before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and fulfilled these prophecies to the letter? Um, and with prayer and with the power of the Holy Spirit, that really is your best way of leading a Jewish person to Jesus and, and causing them to recognize who their true Messiah is. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. I wish we could keep going, but let's cover this again in the next episode. Sure. Thanks, Paul.